and shape of my mom you got to see the person i have become spread your wings and i know the wind god took you back he said hallelujah you're home
when you walk through a storm. Hold your head up high and don't be afraid of the dark. the storm there's a golden sky and the sweet silver song of a luck walk on through the wind walk on through the rain your dreams be tossed and blown. Walk on, walk on, with hope in your heart, and you'll
spending quality time with. service of thanksgiving to celebrate the life of our dearly beloved John Edmund Lewis. I heard about a nickname floating around. Maybe I may receive the story behind that name before the service is closed. I'd like to welcome all of you here today and those who are online On behalf of my wife, my family, my church, Truth in Jesus Advent Believers, I would like to express our deepest condolences to Sister Mavis and the family of Brother John. We know that the God of all comforts will be here with you to take this through to take you through this most trying period of uh, your experience at the passing of your loved one. I'd like to acknowledge his brother and his son, 
and brothers and sisters. To commence this service at this time, I will now offer a prayer to the God whom John served, acknowledging him to be the only one that can save. Bow your heads with me as we pray. Eternal God and Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are a God of comfort. We thank you that you are a God of love and compassion. We know that you understand what we are going through at this time, especially the family of Brother John. For you have experienced separation even in your life. And dear Lord, we pray at this time that you would draw divinely close to each person here today, especially Sister Mavis and the family of Brother John. We thank you that we can celebrate his life, for he has left a legacy. He has made a decision for you, leaving an example to others that they can follow. So as we go into this service, Lord, we pray that our hearts will be comforted and blessed. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. I will now call on Sister Michelle Brewster to lead us in uh, some songs. Good morning to everyone. We will now have the first hymn, Praise to the Lord, the Almighty, the King of Creation. Salvation. 
Sunday scripture reading by Trevor Brewster. No, that's not the. Our next hymn is Great is Thy Faithfulness. have the scripture reading by Trevor Brewster, followed by a musical selection by Sandra Trotman, and a tribute by Sabrina Waite. Good morning. The scripture reading is taken from Revelation 21, and we are reading from verse 1 to 5. Revelation 21, reading from verse 1 to 5. And they begin. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth was, were passed away, and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. 
And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. And there shall be no more death, neither sorrow, neither crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I will make all things new. And he said unto me, Write, for these words are faithful, are true and faithful. Amen. The skies shall unfold, preparing his entrance. The stars shall applaud.
I'm not supposed to cry. That's not what this is about. <laughs> Amen. It is well, it is well with my soul, with my soul. It is well, it is well. Well so deep of countless recounts. It was a task, I tell you, as I painstakingly pulled precious memories that filled buckets of perfectly distilled, thoroughly processed memories that I present to you today. I assure you a pH no lower than 10. The last words I gathered con contained providence. And it's funny because I attempted to poetically place poised poetry to tell a story that isn't just mine to tell. Uncle John. Uncle John manifested the characteristics of his namesake. As I read them listed, it was uncanny, the similarities. There is power in a name. From New York to Barbados, he stained hearts like meticulously placed paints on stained glass, reflecting in the sun, God's son, by no choice of his own. Ah, boy, morning time, brother, my sister, he would often say, before he said something that prompted pondering or left you smiling for hours. As I sifted through disks of memories, a picture painted itself before me of benevolence. Uncle John was in the nick of time without even knowing it. Is it just me that thought the van held everything? From clove oil for toothaches, I still share today, it works by the way, to silver, charcoal, and pipe wrenches. There aren't enough holders on calendars to contain the gifts that were given. Plucking a particular date from the calendar, a jackhammer had embedded itself deep into stone like a certain sword that became a challenge for countless strong men. Tried for a week and concluded that the bit wasn't budging. John came to Simon and said, wait, it was in the van. Like, like Arthur with a pipe wrench, he removed the sword from the stone victoriously. He was there when you needed him. I'm convinced God whispered to John, because how else could he know to bestow his time, words, prayers, or a simple ear just when you needed it? Wells that give never run dry, humbly. John was a visionary discretionately manifesting, practically progressive dreams to goals and goals to achievements from brilliant walkthroughs of falafels, didn't know what those were before, to fishing and farming to cooking. Ooh, he was a cook. Proposals that made close friends close loans a little higher because proposals seemed promising. From nature's sunrise to well after sunset, spent deliberating the future of Andrea Great men battling differences over fishing. The big project changed five minutes to five hours of, from work to no work, to no work for the rest of the day, to discuss fishing fish and souls alike. Uncle John was the talk of the town for us church brethren. It began for us when the church was smaller and the circle was closer and there was no COVID-19. And the choice is mine, set off triggers of debates that left us youth wondering when it would end. Every time he shared, you knew he studied extensively. We were in for a discussion, discussion. He fit as a part of our small family so perfectly, like a puzzle piece that fit right in the middle that wasn't complete without it. And the melodious harmony that resounded from Charity Hall when the Lewis's voice sprang from microphones was nothing less than miraculous. Before my daddy could sing, he would volunteer John. I loved working with him distinctly at the district hospital. 
John was a dapper. His outfits were immaculate. And among, among other things, Auntie Mavis matched his style. The choice was Christ's. If they aren't a Christian, expect anything. And if you are a Christian, he'd call you out for your pessimism. I stand here before you smiling. After compiling all this in writing, I saw a thought presiding. Life is a blessing, and there's something refreshing about giving. So if anything, take this memory and give to many. Thank you. Praise God. We now have a musical selection, instrumental by Joshua and Jerry Lewis, followed by a musical selection, Margot Lewis, and then we will have the eulogy by Rohan and Dwayne Lewis. Margot Harris. Jerry Harris. Okay.
I cannot put into words what we feel, but I will try my best. I attempted to write a eulogy, but words escaped me. But one thing I could say about John is that he had many lessons to teach, and he left us many lessons to learn. On February 4th, 1956, Born to Daphne and Stanley Lewis came this bouncing baby boy, a joy most would see. He was a friend that stick up closer than a brother to many of you, and he was a brother that was truly a friend. John would always tell us, help those who cannot help themselves, lesson number one and it was clearly seen in his vision for his um, water business, his health spa. In that quest, he asked me, he asked Mavis, he asked my wife, he asked family members, what do you think would take off in Barbados? Do you think a health spa would? And we all said yes. And then, hence the birth of the spa. Then when he was moving back from New York to Barbados, my brother David said to him, John, one day water is gonna cost more than gas. And with that, the birth of Alcatel. As the young lady first once said, he was a visionary. He would think of an idea and then it would become a reality. And most of his ideas always end up in a monetary gain. Now, for me, on a personal note, I learned much from him. He was a man of the arts, and by that I mean martial arts. He liked jujitsu, he was a black belt in jujitsu, of much which he taught me, so don't mess with me. <laughs> and then, he was a great cook. He loved to experiment. He would go to nature, watch what his sheep eat, and say, you know what, let me try that. And next thing you know, he's making a herbal tea, not knowing the outcome. John was many things to many people. He was like his father, who loved people. He put people before himself. And the lesson that he wants to leave behind is that when you need help, seek it early. He left behind all of you his brothers and sisters, his wife Mavis, his son Chris, daughter Shanique, nieces and nephews. Yes, we all mourn his loss and we're gonna miss him very much. John would say, let's keep it real. He wants this message to be a message of love. Let's have love for one another. I mean, our family is really close. We talk to each other every day. Mavis, I know that he loves you unconditionally. And I know you think that you are going to be alone till the end of your days. But I assure you that is not the case. We love you. And we're going to be here to support 
to protect, to guide, to encourage from a distance, the New York crew. And from close, right here in Barbados, your in-laws at your request. To the friends and family, what can I say? I'm sure that you feel just the same as we do. I'm gonna miss him very much. And I wanna thank you all for being here. My addition to the eulogy is primarily from the perspective of his nieces and nephews. Uncle John, as we called him, by the time most of us came on the scene, he was living in New York. So it should be no surprise that our memories of him begin with time spent on our trips there or while he was on vacation here in Barbados. Uncle John was a protector. On one of these summer vacations in the US, Jerry and Pedro went out late one night, as Jerry recalls, to get cranberry juice. While out that night, they were mugged. Well, actually, Jerry was mugged. Pedro ran away. <laughs> when they got back to the apartment and told John, he was quick to take them back out onto the street to see if he can find these guys. They didn't. The next day, however, Jerry thought he saw one of the guys. And before he could realize that he wasn't, John had him pinned onto a wall. John was fearless. Pedro said, my Uncle John is around, we feel safe. His protection and care for us also had a softer side. Another summer, again in the US, I managed to cut myself on the back of my head. Don't ask how. Dr. John came to the rescue. He removed the hair from around the cut making a circle and dress the womb. Then he tried to convince me when in public, no one is looking at you, as I'm very conscious of this circle in the back of my head. <laughs> I was not convinced. Uncle John was a salesman and businessman. When he returned to Barbados on holiday, he would often bring things to sell, if there were curtains or clothes. Denise recalls her first professional looking skirt suit, being from Uncle John, a blue, white, and pink, as she recalls. John seemed always ready to explore some new business idea. He was into hot dog carts at some point, how he roasted peanuts, we have runners, he raised chickens. These are some of the things he tried in the early years. As, as Rohan mentioned, Uncle John was a black belt in jiu-jitsu and would teach us a few moves when here on holiday. He would call us one at a time and instruct us to strike. So the sessions went something like this. Come Ian, or come Jerry, strike. Now in anticipating, anticipation of a counter punch, we would stand back out of his arm's reach and he would grab and pull us in. I see you can't hit me from there. And put our fist to his chest and say, repeat the instruction, strike and we would hit him, strike, and we get in a few hits. And by the third or so punch, sure enough, with a few swift movements, we would be at the end of his strike. And the bigger you were, the harder he would strike. So never was I so happy to be the smallest one in the crowd. <laughs> he would take it easy on me. He would then go through the movements more slowly so we could follow and learn. John the Fisherman, Jerry tells of a trip with John and the other uncles when he was, or they were all on a boat, Jerry was next to John fishing and uh, catching more fish than John was. And John would encourage Jerry, Jerry, you're doing damage. When he realized that he wasn't catching any fish, he would lean in and ask, what bait are you using? <laughs> John didn't catch many fish that night. Ian, John's nephew, not brother, his last memory of John was the night they went fishing. They started around four at Bottom Bay, worked their way around to Concept Bay. Ian had a spool, John had a rod. And as Ian recalls, there was sargassum seaweed at the time. 
when Ian threw his line out, the, the, the line got hooked up in the spool and everything fell in, the, fell in the sea. John had a hearty laugh. John then spent most of the evening fishing Ian's spool out of the sea instead of fishing for fish. And Ian's words, verbatim, and you know John, John had this cheeky smile. Even when we got in the van, he had bread and sweet bread and pouring all sorts of things in the van, just there. And we had a good night, man. Soft drinks and some porn. And John just laughing. The first thing he can ask, you want something to eat? And you know John can feed you. John, John's sweet man. Lovely uncle, love him. It's Ian's words. John on a boat, not fishing this time. Denise didn't have a fishing story to share, but she did create a last ditch, but she did create some lasting memories with Uncle John on a boat. In 2019, we had a family cruise. We would get up early in the morning and walk and watch the sunrise as the boat would pull into another port. This was special for D, for D, more like priceless, because she got to spend quality time with Uncle John talking about life and relationships and business. Then you would hear the question, you hungry? <laughs> Let's get something to eat. It was time for breakfast, with his iconic smile. Some of the things she would miss most, some of the things she would miss most about Uncle John are his smile, his charm, and his wit. John was a risk taker. It takes a special kind of confidence to start a business, and whatever characteristics and whatever those characteristics are that make up that kind of confidence, John had them. Denise called him the billionaire man and often said he could bottle business ideas and sell them. Pedro added, my uncle was not a quitter. No matter how long it took, he was determined to become a successful businessman. Evidence of this is in the company he founded over 10 years ago, Alcatan Inc. While none of the ventures he started before, which I mentioned earlier, still exists, those ventures have proven to be training ground, to be the training ground for him to conceptualize and develop Alcatan. He had also started a clinic, as Rohan mentioned, and a restaurant appropriately named Uncle John. And of course, he invested in fishing boats. John and I interacted most often in the last three years after I agreed to join him and Mavis as a director of Alcatan Inc. The last time I saw John, who we often refer to as John Lou, now that you're an adult, you could call him John Lou instead of Uncle John. The last time I saw John was the Monday after the effects of his illness seemed to have been wearing off. While, recording, while recalling sorry, what happened in the three preceding days, he said, among many other things to me, Dwayne, look how easily I could have died. While in the hospital, he was still taking orders to deliver water. Customers would call and say they spoke to John and he doesn't sound well. John called, John called the office from the hospital while we were having a briefing one morning. And this was the last time we heard his voice. I couldn't, uh, I couldn't understand what he was trying to say at the time. And Uncle John left us on October 24th of this year. John was a businessman, a caregiver, a counselor, a friend, a father, a brother, a husband, an uncle, and so much more. He touched many lives and will be missed by many. And I'll end as Ian ended his account of his fishing trip that took them to Concept Bay. John, sweet John, lovely uncle, love him. Brother Leach, you were asking about how he got the nickname Floats. We're, we're researching that as well. <laughs> we are now going to be favored with an item of a selection of music by Robert Carter. Afterward, the next voice we're going to hear is that of Pastor Jason Peters, who also will lead us in the somehow cheering as a Christian vote.
I know that I'm always expected to stand up and sing, but I'm not going to do that today. I met John just last year, and we went into COVID. I had the unfortunate circumstance of having an accident. My car was kept at the dealers for seven months, and my wife's vehicle, the battery went dead. And we were in this vortex, not able to move. We couldn't go to the supermarket at the time. And John showed up with a truck full of greens. John found his way to my house in St. James. I'm Avis, and I'm eternally grateful for them in my life. I only met them last year. And earlier this year, we spent a day together. And it was a really good evening. And uh, we made arrangements for, I, 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 figured, I figured out how the name Floats came about. We made arrangements for him to teach my daughter how to swim. He really went through the, the idea of buoyancy in water and he went through the whole thing with me. I didn't understand the thing he was saying because I still can't swim. <laughs> but the, the very day that my daughter said, Daddy, let's, let's go up was the very day we learned that he was ill. I am going to miss him. Our relationship was just getting started. But I, I, one thing that I can say about John, sitting with him, interacting with him, that was a peaceful man. He was a very peaceful man and a very knowledgeable man. I'm going to miss him. No more next. The timeless thee, earth and heaven will pass away. It's not a dream. God will make all things new. One day, gone is the curse from which I stumbled and fell. Evil is banished to eternal hell. No more nights and no more pain. No more tears, never crying. Again and praises to the great I am. We will live in the light of a risen land. See all around now the nations bow down to sing the only sound is of praises to Christ our King. Slowly the names from the book are. King, there's no need to dread no more nights and no more pain, no more tears, never crying again. And the praises to the great I am, we will live in the light.
Savior eternally. There will be no more nights and no more pain. Never crying again. And a prayer. shall be no more night. There shall be no more pain. There shall be no more death. Amen? Amen. For a great day is coming when he who has redeemed us shall come again to take us unto himself and we shall be with him throughout the ceaseless ages of eternity. I want to take this opportunity to express on behalf of my family Deepest condolences to Sister Mavis, all the family members and friends. The news of John's passing broke my heart. I had not known John for very long, just a few years, associating with him at the church, at his business, at his home. And what I've learned of John, the way that he took care of my parents when they, when they came for treatment, for therapy, reveals or revealed the kind of person he is. And as I, as I listened to all the things that were being said and learning more of who he was, indeed, a shining example of what a believer should be. When I think of John and his life, in fact, every time I saw John, every time I interacted with him, somehow it reminded me of the gospel. It reminded me of, of Jesus Christ. It reminded me of the words of Jesus. And as we celebrate his life, I want to take the opportunity to reflect on his life and to reflect on what I felt every time I interacted with John. John took very literally the words of Jesus in the book of the gospel that bears his name. John chapter 7. In John chapter 7, the Bible tells us that the nation of Israel, the Jewish people, was celebrating the Feast of Tabernacles. In John chapter, John chapter 7, rather, I want to read for us verses 1 and 2. After these things, Jesus walked into Galilee, for he would not walk among the Jewish people 
because they were trying to kill him. Verse 2 says, now the Jews' feast of tabernacles was at hand. Now, if you don't know what the feast of tabernacles is, it's the final feast in, in the feast in, in a list of seven ceremonial celebrations that the Jewish people had. It was an annual round of celebration. Seven feasts in all. And the Feast of Tabernacles was the final of those feasts that brought the Jewish ceremonial system to an end for that year. And it began all over again at the end of that feast. The Feast of Tabernacles was a celebration of all that God had provided, all that he had done for the nation of Israel. From the very first feast that was celebrated, the Feast of Passover, which represented a deliverance of the children of Israel from, from Egyptian bondage. When God said to them, kill a lamb, spread the blood upon the doorpost, that when the destroying angel passes by, he would see that blood and pass over. And all those within that house would be saved. And all the different feasts that were celebrated there. But the Feast of Tabernacles was a special feast. You see, the Feast of Tabernacles represented the fact that the children of Israel who were celebrating a bountiful harvest that God had given them throughout the year. The only reason they, that they could have celebrated a bountiful harvest during the Feast of Tabernacles is because God, in his perfect time in in his grace and in his mercies had sent rain that had caused the crop to ripen and, and to bear bountifully and the feast of tabernacles was a celebration of all the bountiful harvest that the children of Israel had, had received only due to the fact that the rains the former rain and the latter rain was sent by God in due season. You see, the Feast of Tabernacles indicated that water was life. Without water from the rain, there could be no harvest. Without water from the rain, there could be no life. And John understood that water was life. And so in John chapter 7, the Bible tells us that the children of Israel, the Jewish people, are celebrating this feast of tabernacles as they, as they bring an end to the ceremonial year. And they give God thanks and praise and they magnify the God of heaven who had sent the rain, the water of life, that had brought in a bountiful harvest. And they were saying thanks to God. And the Bible tells us in John chapter 7, Verse 37, the Bible says, listen to this. In the last day of that great feast, the feast was eight days long. In the last day, that's verse 37 of John chapter 7, the book that bears John's name. In the last day of that feast, the Feast of Tabernacles, Jesus stood up and cried with a loud voice saying, if any man thirst, what do we thirst for? Or what should we thirst for? Water. If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. For water is life. And I remember sitting with John. And John tried to explain to me all the delicate things that water does. Beautiful. And, 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 and every time I listened to John, somehow it just reflected the reality of the kingdom of God. That water is life. And Jesus, understanding this, says said to the children of Israel and says to us today, if any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. And Jesus then says in verse 38, he that believes on me, as the scripture says, out of his belly shall flow 
a river of living water. For water is life. And John understood that. You see, this Feast of Tabernacles, which was the last of the seven feasts that the children of Israel were celebrating, pointed to the reality that one day God will bring in a bountiful harvest. When this life on earth would have come to an end, sin and the devil, the author of destruction, pain and death, would have been destroyed himself. He would have come to an end. And God is going to usher in that eternal reign of peace. That's what the Feast of Tabernacles points to. When God's people shall be gathered together from every corner of the earth. Taken from this sin-cursed earth. It points to that blessed hope that the Christian has. Paul speaks of that blessed hope that we as Christians are looking forward to. You see, there is one thing to have hope. You can hope in something that never happens. You can hope for something that never becomes a reality. You're sitting here before me this morning. You may have hoped for things that never came, never came through. But you see, for the Christian... The second coming of Jesus, which, which we are hoping for, and which we are hoping for that is going to be very soon, that hope that we have as Christians, which buoys us up, is not just a hope. Because there are many things that we have hoped for, which never came through. But for the believer, it is not just the hope, it's a blessed hope. What makes it a blessed hope is the fact that it is very sure. It will happen. There is no doubt of the reality concerning this hope. And so Paul writes to, to Titus and he says to him in Titus chapter 2 verse 13 that as Christians, as Christians, as Christians, as believers, this was John's hope. We are looking for that blessed hope. It's a certain hope. It's a hope that we are so sure about that it, it goes beyond hope. It is true. It is a fact. It is going to happen. And that's what the Feast of Tabernacles pointed to. And that's what the water the living water that was celebrated during the Feast of Tabernacles, that's what it points to. That one day, that living water, Jesus Christ, will come again to receive us unto himself. You see, when Jesus died on the cross, and that's why I said to you every time I, I spoke to John, the reality of God's kingdom just came before my eyes. When Jesus died on the cross, do you know what, what, what came out of his side? Blood and water. Because water is life. And John understood that. And so Paul says to Titus, we are looking as Christians, as believers, we are looking for that blessed hope, which is the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. That's the blessed hope that buoys us up, that keeps us going in spite of the reality of this life, in spite of the presence of death, in spite of the presence of pain and suffering. As believers, we are able to look beyond that. And I hear the words of Paul when he says, if in this life only we have hope, we are of all men most miserable. The reality, the, the true reality of this life goes beyond that which we see before us. And if you're listening to me this morning and that hope is not a present reality in your life, my prayer and my desire for you today is that it becomes a reality in your life. 
Because soon and very soon, the reality of the Feast of Tabernacles is going to be ushered in by God. For I hear John the Revelator writes in Revelation chapter 21. And this is what John says. And this is what John is saying to us this morning. Not just out of the Gospel of John, but from the book of Revelation written by John. So John says to us, I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God, and God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. There shall be no more death. Neither shall there be sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are all passed away. And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Write these words, for they are true and faithful. And John said, in the new Jerusalem, in the new city of God, there will be a river of life flowing from the throne. You see, wherever God is, there is a river of water. For water is life. And John understood that. May that water of life that Jesus offers May you allow that river of life to flow through your life. And when Jesus comes, may we be gathered with him in that new Jerusalem as we celebrate with John the Feast of Tabernacles where Jesus himself shall be with us and we shall be with him forever and ever. Amen and amen. I invite you to stand as we sing the hymn, hymn number 440. How cheering is the Christian's hope, the blessed hope that we have as believers. Let's all stand together.
Be seated, please. We want to call on Christopher to give us the vote of thanks. Shanique, I'm John's daughter. Um, every relationship we'll ever have, every person we'll ever meet is for a reason, a season, or a lifetime. And this is significant because the time doesn't matter. Each one is significant. Johnny Lewis was my dad. He's the only father I will ever know. He taught me so many things. I will spend all day and all night here telling you them. I'm a green belt in jujitsu because of him and many other things. He taught me the value of honesty, integrity, courage, and commitment. It's a Navy slogan. It's funny because uh, I knew those things way before I joined. He taught me to know who you were before you showed up. He taught me that judgment is for the Lord and not for us. He says, no one is above or beneath you. My dad was a visionary. He taught me to dream big. He taught me to never give up on my dreams or my goals, especially when you're doubted. That's when you hold on tight to them and you fight for them. The more, thank you. The most important lesson that he taught me though was that family wasn't about DNA. Family was about sacrifice, love, commitment, and loyalty. So love one another, help your neighbor, be compassionate to your brothers and your sisters. Practice active listener. He was such a good listener, and I think I'll miss that most. Chase your dreams, chase them, chase them. Encourage, and, encourage one another to live your lives to the fullest, because that's what my dad would do. Thank you. Well, one thing I could say he always taught me was respect. He always taught me to respect my elders, friends, family, anybody. Um, and then he told me if I ever have a problem with somebody to always speak with respect. And one thing I learned from him is that respect gets you very far down the line. Just by seeing how many people showed up, he had a lot of respect. And I want to thank everybody for showing up. That's all I have to say. Let us all stand and we're going to sing that closing hymn 633 when we all get to heaven. Sing the wondrous love of Jesus, sing his mercy and his grace. In the mansions bright and blessed, he'll prepare for us a place. When we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. When we all
Gracious Father and our God, we thank you for all of the proceedings this morning, and we thank you for gracing us with your presence. We thank you for the life of our dear brother, friend, father. We thank husband. We thank you that you have uh, used him in his life to leave a legacy, a legacy of love, a legacy of faith, a legacy of determination and boldness. And we are asking that we would all learn the lessons that you have, uh, through him, given to us and left with us so that we can be better people this side of eternity, that one day we will see each other again in glory. Let the words of our mouths and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O oh Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. We are now going to have a selection of music by Robert Carter in the recessional. Rece down by the lamb I want to know everything about that lamb on saw the day but he did not see night the lamb of God well he must be the light he, he saw the saints worship the great I am crying worthy worthy is the lamb I want that city he 
saw New Jerusalem Jerusalem I want to find Your streets that are spending quality time with me, John Lewis.
spending quality time with me, John Lewis.
We invite you to bow your heads as we pray. Eternal Father and our God, the God of life, you have given us the promise that you are the God of Abraham, you are the God of uh, Isaac, you are the God of Jacob, you are not the God of the dead, but the God of the living. And this is the assurance that our dear brother and friend and loved one, Brother John, will be resurrected to see you in glory. And therefore, we humble our hearts before you in acceptance of your will in all things. And therefore, we pray that all loved ones will be comforted through this process in understanding that you will never leave nor forsake. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. For as much as God, in his infinite love and wisdom, has permitted our dear brother John Edmund Lewis to fall asleep in Christ, we do tenderly commit his body to the ground, earth to earth, ashes to ashes, dust to dust, in the sure and certain hope of a joyful resurrection when our Lord shall return in glory. Then this body of humiliation shall be changed and be made like unto his glorious body, according to the mighty workings whereby he is even able to subdue all things unto himself. Amen. Let's sing the song, "'Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus."
Paul says to us in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 19, If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. But now is Christ risen from the dead and has become the first fruit of them that sleep. For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. For he must reign till he has put all things under his feet. And the last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. Him lifting my maker and my king to thee, my all I owe. in Thessalonians chapter 4 from verse 13 he says but I would not have you to be ignorant brethren concerning them which are asleep that you sorrow not even as others which have no hope for if we believe that Jesus died and rose again even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him for this we say unto you by the word of the Lord that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and the trump of God, and the dead shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the cloud to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Therefore comfort one another with these words. Hymn number 198, And can it be that I should gain an interest in the Savior's blood? See 
is in love indeed. Paul continues to write, and he says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, the great apostle writes, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Hymn number 21, Immortal, Invisible, God only.
When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll. Hymn number 530.
this afternoon, well, this morning, on behalf of the family of John, on behalf of the church, his church family as well, we say thanks to you for being here. We know that many others wanted to be here, but because of the protocols, they could not be. We want to say thanks for the words of comfort that you shared, for the moments of prayer that you offered on behalf of the family, and for your simply being here. We say thank you. At this time, we invite you to bow your heads as we offer the final word of prayer. Our great God and Father, our Creator, our Redeemer, and our soon-coming King, today we acknowledge that in spite of the circumstances of life, in spite of painful moments like this, that there is a great tomorrow, a great getting up morning, the blessed hope that you have given to your people. We look forward to that day when you shall come, when according to your word, the dead in Christ shall rise. And so we ask today that you mark the spot where our brother lies, that you ask your angels to mark that spot where his mortal remains are. That on that resurrection morning when you shall call, he would get up according to the mighty workings of Jesus Christ. May we all be gathered together with you on that sea that looks like glass. Father, until then, we ask that by your presence of your Holy Spirit, through the sweet influence of heaven, that our lives may live in harmony with you. Bless us, take us home safely, guide and protect us on the roads, and keep us for your eternal kingdom. We pray through Jesus Christ, our Lord, let everyone say, Amen. God bless you, everybody. So